Hello again. This video is all about data visualizations and how these powerful data storytelling tools can be used for misinformation. Data visualizations are also known as data viz. They're a great way to communicate trends in a data set using graphics. They can take the form of charts, tables, maps, infographics, and timelines. Data visualizations used to be reserved for academic, business, or finance reports, but they are increasingly becoming more common in the media. The New York Times and other journalistic organizations now have data teams. It makes sense that more folks are using data visualizations because they're a great way to tell a story with data. They tend to be more engaging and can quickly evoke emotion compared to a narrative description of data. Like other images, data visualizations are easy to share on social media. Unfortunately, like other things online, many people hit the share or like button before confirming the accuracy of what they are sharing, which has led to many viral misinformative data visualizations. In some cases, misleading data visualizations are created on purpose with a certain goal in mind. However, other problematic data visualizations can be unintentionally confusing. In this video, we'll go over some common tactics that result in misleading and confusing data visualizations. We'll start with how color is used. Color is a powerful tool in data visualizations. Take a look at this map. Without any labels, you are probably already making assumptions about the data. You know that the data is focused on the United States. And if I told you the data represented the rate of diabetes in the US, based on this map, what regions would you think have the highest rate of diabetes? Based on common conventions, you would expect the darker colors of the map to mean a higher concentration of whatever is being measured. So this graph makes it look like Colorado has one of the highest rates of diabetes. However, when you look at the key closely, you can see that the lighter color is actually associated with a higher rate of diabetes. Since most folks don't look carefully at the key and would assume the color scale would indicate something different, it is easy for a map like this to lead to misinformation, even if the data that is being used is accurate. Here is what the map would look like if it followed a typical color convention. We see that the higher rates of diabetes are actually concentrated in places like the South. This map is of the results of the 2020 U.S. presidential race, reflecting which states had the majority vote for the Republican or Democratic candidate. The red color for Republicans and the blue color for Democrats has been used consistently for the past two decades. Therefore, the color choices make sense and follow typical color conventions when it comes to election maps. However, using only two colors and thinking of each state as either a red state or a blue state obscures the trend that many states are actually more purple, meaning the percentage of those who voted for the Democratic presidential candidate and those who voted for the Republican candidate are much more similar. By using this color scale, the audience can get a more detailed understanding of the election data. Another common issue we see with data visualizations is in regards to the principle of proportional ink, which is the idea that we often associate the more ink on a page, or in this case, more of a particular color on a map, to mean that the value associated with that color is also larger. This can lead to confusion, especially when looking at maps. Due to the principle of proportional ink, this map makes it look like the Republican candidate could have won because there is so much red ink. But the size of the land on the map is not the same as the size of the population. This is where population bubbles can be useful. The larger the bubble, the larger the population. Now the amount of ink that is used for the Democratic and Republican votes is more proportional to the actual number of votes. The proportional ink concept can also be applied to graphs and charts. This bar chart is supposed to show how the height of British men has changed over a century. They use these fun little orange guys instead of standard bars. But because of the principle of proportional ink, 
it looks like men have doubled in height in just 100 years. But when you look at the y-axis, you see that it's been truncated, meaning it does not start at zero, which leads to the issue of disproportional ink making it look like the changes in height over time have been much more dramatic than the roughly 10 centimeters in growth that has actually occurred. Manipulating the y-axis is a strategy that is often used to influence how a graph is interpreted. Let's say for a research project, I want to show that nearly everybody wears just black and white shoes. So I hang out in downtown Atlanta and document the main colors of the first 300 pairs of shoes that walk past me. Thinking back to our previous video, this would be a convenient sample. After I have my 300 pieces of data, I graph it. This truncated bar graph makes it look like I saw nine times as many black shoes as I saw shoes that fell into the other category, when really it was only twice as many. If we look at this y-axis, I didn't start at zero. This is a truncated y-axis. When I graph the data using a y-axis that starts with zero, the differences between the four groups do not seem as dramatic. A good tip for checking for misleading graphs is to look at the axes. The graphs shown in this visual from YouTube do not have labeled y-axes. This is a common faux pas in data visualization. If you look at the labels for each graph, you can see that their y-axes are based on different scales. While this makes sense for the intention of this graphic to show that protest-related songs spiked during the summer of 2020, it could be confusing for the viewer. The graph creator also uses a different scale for the x-axis on both graphs. On the This is America graph on the left, it shows the views per day across a six-month span, while the Fight the Power graph on the right shows views per day across a three-month span. This chart was featured in a news article on the site The Conversation, which is supposed to be a place for academics to share their research with the public. The chart and the data associated with it was picked up by other news organizations, including two articles in the Washington Post. By reading the headlines and looking at the chart, it looks like what musical genre a musician falls under could be deadly. It shows that the life expectancy of rap and hip-hop artists is much lower than the life expectancy for jazz and blues artists. Let's take a moment to think about why this chart might be misleading. Which of these musical genres are newer? Just a reminder that disco was popular in the 70s and hip-hop didn't start getting regular radio airtime until the 80s. That means the musicians in the genres in the red are more likely to be younger and still alive. Those who have died, and you would have had to die to make it into the status set, would have likely died quite prematurely since they were younger. This is an example of what is termed as right censoring, where important values are missing from the data set. There simply hasn't been enough time that has passed since the creation of these musical genres to say anything meaningful about the life expectancies for musicians in newer genres of music. Another issue with this graph is that despite the x-axis consisting of categorical variables, the music genres, the author used a line graph when they should have used a bar graph. This chart has issues with both its data and how it's visualized, yet reputable media outlets still picked up the story. The author of this graph in the Wall Street Journal wanted to demonstrate that he thought the Obama administration tax cuts would mostly affect the middle class and not the rich, as the author states in the headline. However, the data itself doesn't really demonstrate that unless you use certain types of data visualization. Again, let's take a closer look at the axes. The y-axis looks good, but what about the x-axis? Let's take a look at it up close. What do you notice? Well, another way that bar charts can be manipulated is through what is known as binning. Each one of these lines is a bin, and depending on what value ranges were assigned to each bin, the shape of the bar graph will change. 
you'll notice that as the income categories increase, so does the range of the bin. This means that more money and more people can be lumped into these bins. So it makes sense that the majority of incomes are falling into those middle bins. Another argument for why this chart could be misleading would depend on how you define the term middle class. This chart makes it look like the middle class ranges from those making $50,000 all the way to those who are making a million dollars. Some may argue that those who make over $200,000 and up are not part of the middle class. And more would argue that half a million dollars and more for annual household income should not count as middle class either. This type of argument would be against how the author is defining their variable middle class. Like with the last example, using certain headlines or titles for your data visualizations can be a way to shape the story you want to tell with your data. Unfortunately, titles can be a source of misleading or inaccurate information. Say your friend is trying to convince you that they are on their way to becoming a social media influencer, and they show you this graph. It looks like your friend is having a steady incline in followers. But your friend wouldn't want to show you this graph that includes a longer time frame because it indicates that they've actually lost a bunch of followers, started gaining followers back, only to lose them again. This is an example of cherry picking your data, where you only show the data that supports your argument or your agenda. Sometimes folks may not be trying to mislead and just get caught up in trying to be creative when creating data visualizations. And that's when you can get something like this. It is a circle that is broken up into different categories of items Americans spend their money on. But they're all different shapes, so it's difficult to tell the size of each section unless you read the data values. It would have made a lot more sense if they just used a traditional pie chart. In other incidents, the chart designer may choose the correct type of chart to visualize the information, but they don't make the chart correctly, like with this graph used in a news segment on CNN. The chart is supposed to be demonstrating that 57% of restaurant owners are concerned about finding workers. However, the pie chart is only showing about 25%. The designer should have used a pie graph like this to represent their data. This next chart has become infamous for its misleading visualization. The chart is supposed to demonstrate the number of gun deaths that have occurred in Florida over time, while bringing attention to how gun deaths have changed since Florida enacted its Stand Your Ground law in 2005. Have gun deaths increased or decreased? Based on a first glance, it looks like gun deaths have decreased since the line is going down. However, if we take a closer look at the y-axis, we see that it has been inverted with a zero at the top and a thousand at the bottom. This can be very confusing for the viewer. There was so much frustration about this misleading graph that another author recreated the graph with a normal y-axis. With this graph, it makes it much easier to see that gun deaths in Florida have increased since the enactment of the standard ground law. Data visualizations can be wonderful tools for storytelling and disseminating information to the public. However, you should always make sure that you examine data visualizations with a critical eye. Think about the data that's being used, the type of chart, and always check the axes and keys carefully.